discussions, and we're here to talk about the the uh, Kinder Morgan pipeline facilities in uh, Wilsonville, and we have representatives from Kinder Morgan here to provide uh, uh, robust uh, information about that. Uh, as most of you may know, subsequent to some uh, citizen uh, concerns about the pipeline through Wilsonville, we had uh, engaged with Kinder Morgan uh, to talk about the pipeline, and we have been pleased to have dialogue that has gone on over the past year with uh, senior executives from that company, and uh, we have learned a lot about it. We've also had representatives from the uh, Hillsborough Water Big Pipe Project uh, in, involved in that. We've had elected people at the state level as well as uh, the local level coming to those meetings, so I've lost track. Probably three or four major meetings that we've had, and they also brought in their uh, senior people from out of state for those meetings, so uh, it's been productive, and I appreciate the, the dialogue that we've had, and we've talked about the concerns that uh, our people have uh, in our citizenry here, and uh, they've talked about uh, how their protocols work, and we've learned a lot about it, so you will learn some more uh, about that tonight, but uh, we've kind of reached a... Uh, a uh, agreement that uh, certain things need to be done, probably the most uh, significant, and I'm sure they'll tell you about it, is that the uh, shutoff valve that is north of the river will be converted to a, a more automatic type of, of a valve that can be remotely actuated instead of having to be something that a person uh, physically on the site has to, to do. So that's one of the major things. Uh, yesterday, uh, they were involved in a major uh, practice event uh, which is done involving the state DEQ and they uh, hypothecate a, a uh, breach of a certain type and then they respond and they do all the different elements to that and they'll probably tell you a little bit about that. Uh, I was able to go see a little bit about that exercise yesterday and was quite impressed with the thoroughness and the depth of that uh, process also. So uh, other people can tell you a lot more details than I can about it but uh, we are... Uh, we We've reached a, a, an agreement with Kinder Morgan about some of the things that need to be done. The, the exercise that was done yesterday is one of those things, and uh, this evening's presentation for the public is another of them, and the installation of the the uh, safety valve, uh, uh, automatic valve is another one. So they will tell you more details about that. Taken in total, I think that we've had a very robust uh, response. And I think that out of the dialogue we've had, uh, we've reached some very positive kind of accommodation. So I want to thank uh, the Kinder Morgan for their engagement with the community on this. And I don't need to keep talking, but I think I will introduce our uh, city attorney, Barbara Jacobson, who will kind of lead through on this. Uh, she has been involved all along in kind of our negotiations also. So Barbara, would you please? Good evening and thank you for coming. It's really a pleasure to be here and to see you all. Um, as the mayor explained, we've been working with Kinder Morgan for, oh, over a year now, I think, and they've been very um, accommodating and willing to come out and speak with us and we have reached agreement on a new uh, automatic shutoff valve which is a, is a big big improvement for us so we're very appreciative of that and I know there have been concerns um, raised by some of our citizens to the council uh, Sean O'Neill who has been a very um, a strong advocate for making sure that the pipeline is properly monitored and protected um, has raised issues with us and Kinder Morgan has worked with us and in trying to address those issues. So uh, tonight we asked Kinder Morgan since they were here, they um, actually did their, they do a, a major drill every three years on the pipeline and they chose to do it in Wilsonville this year, which is very nice. And as the mayor said, people from DEQ and EPA as well as Kinder Morgan personnel from across the country were at this drill in Wilsonville yesterday and I wasn't there but I understand it was a very thorough and interesting day uh, and then the people who were visiting also got to, besides getting to see our beautiful city they got to experience our extraordinary weather so as they walked out of the drill they had a, a true emergency to get out into but I hear they all survived and made it home um, but we, uh, we have some representatives who were kind enough to stay tonight to talk to you. And so, um, and I think, um, oh, what else? 
the pipeline has been here for a long time and we've you know been fortunate we haven't had incidents in Wilsonville our resident historian counselor Charlotte Lehan tells me that when she was just a teenager she watched segments of it being built so it is uh, and and she'll be here if anybody's got questions about the history of the pipeline in Wilsonville it's always fascinating to hear Charlotte's perspective but for now we'll hear from Kinder Morgan and um, Mark Otnud is going to walk around with cards. So if at the end of the presentation you have any questions, uh, he'll give those questions to me. I'll read them, and Kinder Morgan will uh, do their best to answer any questions that you might have. Presentation's about 30 minutes long, and we have three presenters tonight who I'd like to introduce. Um, our, our presenters are Alan Holbrook, who is Kinder Morgan's operation manager. Lance Karabitz is the area manager. Sean Gray, who is the operations manager. And then we also have Alan Four, who is here with us tonight as well. And uh, so I'll let these gentlemen come up and tell you all about the Kinder Morgan pipeline, especially as it pertains to Wilsonville. Thank you, Barb. Appreciate that. And thank you, Mayor. Um, and we have our operations team here uh, who will walk us through a, a pipeline safety presentation and overview. But I just wanted to add a few comments. I'm Alan Form, Vice President with Kinder Morgan. And when we were approached by the city, actually several cities and, and other organizations over a year ago, um, I think what happened subsequent to that was uh, a very good collaborative effort and a very technical discussion about pipeline safety, enhancements to pipeline safety, uh, best available technology, um, and what can we do specific to the Wilsonville area? Because one of the things that's important, um, you know, we have a system, as, as our team will describe, uh, that is extensive in Oregon, but more extensive across the country, 80,000 miles of, of pipelines. And what works in Wilsonville might not be appropriate in, in Massachusetts. Um, so what we wanted to do was take a look at the particulars of the circumstance here, uh, the water facility, the future plans for growth, um, where our pipeline is located specifically, where the crossing is, the, where the valves are located, uh, and find a solution that met the questions and concerns of, of the city and area and community leaders uh, apply technology, take it back to our operations team and engineers, and get to a solution that um, I think, and I think collectively we all think, is, is a good one. Um, so I, I thank the city and, and everyone that was involved with this um, and asked questions, and we had a lot of work sessions <laughs> uh, and, a lot of, and a lot of very technical discussions, um, and, but that's good. And what I always say from, from any time we have a, um, uh, an issue like this, uh, we, we always learn from it too. And the experience we had here in the Wilsonville area is going to be helpful to us throughout our system as we're always, still, we have a safe system. We believe a system that's very important for energy supply here in the state of Oregon. Uh, but we always want to do everything we can to make it safer. And uh, I think that's one of the enhancements that our team will talk about uh, uh, tonight. So with that, Andrew Holbrook is our operations manager, and he'll start walking us through the presentation. Thank you, Alan. And uh, thank you, Barb, and uh, Mr. Mayor, for the, the summary of our events. Um, certainly the, the drill this week was very exciting, and we appreciate your team participating. I think it helped uh, make it a, a, a much bigger success. It's um, always good to have the local folks involved. So so tonight, as we mentioned, this is about a 30-minute PowerPoint presentation. We'll do this in kind of three stages. I'll start it off, and then I'll pass it off to, uh, to Lane to talk a little bit about more specifics. This is a, an overview of our pipeline system here in, in Oregon. And uh, as the pipeline that runs from Portland to Eugene passes through Wilsonville, it's a, so this will give you a little bit of an idea of um, you know why the pipeline is here, um, what it carries, what it's made from, um, you know what the importance of the line is, how we run it, how we monitor it, um, and and keep it safe. So 
I'm going to push the right button here, hopefully. And there we go. Okay, so why are we here? Um, so in, in general, to raise awareness of uh, general pipeline safety, uh, talk about our pipelines and facilities specific to the area here, uh, talk about the products that we ship and any potential emergency situations, and really to create a forum to exchange information. I think that that's kind of what we've been engaged in with the city for the last year or so on this, uh, this, this pipeline. So water pipelines, I know it's kind of a general opening question. I think we all know what they are, but, but in general, pipelines are used um, in our industry to move gas and liquid products. The vast majority of pipelines are located underground. Pipelines are made out of steel. Uh, we have different kinds of lines for different purposes, transmission lines versus distribution lines. And where pipelines come uh, adjacent to landowners, landowners may use the land or what we call the right of way uh, above the pipeline for most purposes. However, uh, we want to make sure that people don't build structures on top of the pipeline um, and uh, don't plant any deep rooted trees uh, in the right of way. All right, so in general, who uh, I think get a little bit of a flavor for who we are, but I'll, I'll go through a few more specifics about who Kinder Morgan is. Um, we are one of the largest energy infrastructure companies in North America. As, as Alan said, we have about 84,000 miles of pipeline and 157 terminals throughout North America, over 11,000 employees uh, here in the U.S. and in Canada. We are the largest natural gas transporter and storage operator in the United States. And so 70,000 miles of that 84,000 miles of pipeline are dedicated to natural gas service. And we transport nearly 40% of the natural gas that's consumed within the United States. So it's a pretty strategic part of our business. Uh, Kinder Morgan is also the largest independent transporter of petroleum products in the United States. So we move on a, on a daily basis about 2.1 million barrels of product through 9,000 miles of refined products pipelines. We're also the largest independent terminal operator in the United States. And so we have in the, on the liquid side of our terminals business, we store refined petroleum products, um, chemicals, ethanol, biodiesel, and, and other products. And we have a capacity of about 151 million barrels in our system. We also have bulk terminals uh, in, in the Kinder Morgan that handle such materials such as coal, petroleum, coke, steel, and, and many other commodities. And we handle about 59 million tons per year of those types of products. So here's an overview of our pipeline system throughout uh, mostly the United States, a little bit into Canada. The different colors um, sort of denote the different types of service the pipelines are in. You see a lot of red pipelines, so that's the natural gas pipeline system, as we saw in the earlier slide. It's about 70,000 miles of natural gas pipelines throughout the United States. And then about 9,000 miles of our products pipelines that move primarily refined products um, such as gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. And so the, the little piece that we're talking about here is, if I press the right button, right here. So starting in uh, Portland and running south to Eugene is where that pipeline terminates. So specific to Oregon, so we operate 212 miles of pipeline within the state. Um, we have the, uh, what we call the, excuse me, oh, wrong, wrong button. Um, the Oregon pipeline, as we call it here, which runs from Portland down to Eugene. We also have a little bit of a natural gas pipeline called the Ruby pipeline that comes into the state, very southern end of the state. Um, and we have an, a short pipeline, about eight and a half miles, that runs from northwest Portland to PDX. We supply PDX with 100% of its jet fuel. So we operate also four terminals within the state of Oregon. Three of those are liquid terminals, and uh, one is a bulk terminal. We employ 70 people currently in the state, and we pay uh, typically on an annual basis about $6 million in state and local tax. All right, so the products that, uh, that we handle in our systems here in, in Oregon um, primarily are focused on automotive fuel. So we have um, two terminals in northwest Portland. We call the Wilbridge and the Linton Terminal. And we store about 1.9 million barrels of fuel, a barrel being 42 U.S. gallons. And they're major sources of gasoline and diesel fuel for motorists in the region. And the other pipeline that we, we mentioned is the jet fuel line that runs eight and a half miles from northwest Portland to PDX and supplies the jet fuel for PDX. 
Um, as you can imagine, we're reasonably highly regulated as an industry, and uh, our pipeline systems fall under the regulatory oversight of what's known as the Office of Pipeline Safety, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Transportation. Kinder Morgan as a company, we're very committed to public safety, protection of the environment, um, and operating our facilities with, uh, within the compliance of all the rules and regulations that apply to us. We're also very proud of our safety record. Um, all of our employees are. I mean, it's not, not just me, but every one of our employees are very proud of the safety record that we have. We follow numerous regulations and procedures to monitor and ensure the integrity of our pipelines. So this just gives you a little bit of a list of some of the agencies that oversee different aspects of our business um, with the Department of Transportation, uh, PHMSA being the major uh, regulator of pipelines. We're also regulated by the US EPA, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the Coast Guard, and Homeland Security, especially on our marine-based facilities, uh, the Oregon Public Utilities Commission, and the DEQ and local health agencies here within the state of Oregon. So how do we get our products here uh, in the state of Oregon? Well, there's really two main supply lines that come into the state. Of course, there's no refining capacity here within the state of Oregon. So a lot of the product uh, is refined up here in the northwest part of Washington state. There are four major refineries. There is a small one also in Tacoma. And then that product is uh, shipped primarily on the Olympic pipeline system. The Olympic pipeline system is not a Kinder Morgan uh, system, but that does bring the product down into Seattle area and ultimately terminates in Portland. And in Portland is where our pipeline uh, picks up the product and takes it down into Eugene. Within the uh, Portland area, there are seven major petroleum terminals that receive product uh, from Olympic Pipeline. And then the other method of receiving product is um, by a marine vessel. Could be ocean-going barges or ships that bring it in through the Columbia Willamette River system to us. So that's the flow of products uh, pretty much throughout the, the Northwest. Here's a little bit of a closer snapshot of uh, where the pipeline runs through Wilsonville. So you see it's a little bit, a little bit light, and here's a little bit hard to tell, but this green line is our pipeline. So we're running from north to south on the way down to Eugene, uh, I-5 being here. So we're kind of on the western side of, of Wilsonville, Willamette River being here. The, um, the valve that we were talking about uh, that was mentioned earlier is what we call the uh, Wilsonville block valve here. It's, it's about a quarter of a mile north of the river. And the project that we're engaged in right now is to, um, is to put a remotely uh, operated actuator on that valve that will then be controlled by one of our two control rooms that control the pipeline. That'll give us the ability to shut that line down um, and close that valve remotely from the control center rather than having to deploy a person physically to close that valve by hand. So it's a big time saver in case we need to shut the pipeline down. It also isolates a further seven miles of pipeline from the next valve upstream to the north, which is near the Tualatin River. Okay, and with that, we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of our pipeline shipping system, and I'll pass it over to uh, Lane Karabych. Uh, Lane is our, oper our area manager, and so his area of responsibility is really the greater Portland area and the pipeline all the way down to the Salem area. Thank you. And forward. This one? Yeah. Um, so uh, Andrew mentioned... Uh, can Oops. Uh, Andrew mentioned the control room. Um, this is it. This is an aerial view. It's right on uh, Highway 30. Um, this is Portland Station. Um, incoming lines from seven pat uh, petroleum terminals in northwest Portland. 114-mile, uh, eight-inch pipeline. Uh, it's the primary refined petroleum supply system for central and southern Oregon, so it serves about 1.1 million people. Um, there's no terminals uh, south of Eugene so they're in, until you get to California, so it, it serves a vast area. Uh, what we transport, um, uh, this pipeline trans it's, uh, transports several grades of refined petroleum products from Portland to Eugene. Uh, gasoline, which is unleaded regular and premium. Uh, diesel, which is the Oregon spec V5 biodiesel blend. As Andrew mentioned, the Portland Airport pipeline, uh, we supply 100% of uh, PDX's jet fuel through our 8-inch pipeline that uh, goes from northwest Portland over to the airport. Uh, we operate 24-7, 365. Uh, most often asked question, how much we transport. Um, daily, Portland Station moves, and this is an average, um, 
40,000 barrels of product. Um, 40,000 barrels equals 1.68 million gallons, and so that's every day. Um, that's equivalent to 186 tanker trucks each day, you know, running up and down the I-5 corridor. It's a lot of trucks, um, each truck being 9,000 gallons. Um, so pipeline protection. Um, pipeline operating conditions are continuously monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, operators in control centers monitor the pipelines, uh, both in Portland and in Houston. Uh, supervisory control or data acquisition, um, we call it SCADA, which is basically a computer system. Um, it gathers data, you know, pipeline pressures, volumes, flow rates, um, status of our pumping equipment and our valves, uh, the rate of drag reducing agent injection. Uh, whenever an operating condition changes on the pipeline, uh, an alarm alerts the operator on duty. Both automated and manual valves are strategically placed along the pipeline system to enable the pipeline to be shut down immediately and sections isolated quickly. Uh, this is just an overview of our Portland control room. As you can see, it's a very small footprint, unlike our Houston control center, which is very large. Um, this monitor on the left is the entire Oregon pipeline, and then the monitor on the right is the entire uh, airport pipeline. Just an overview screen. Uh, more on pipeline protection. So vegetation on the right of way um, is, is maintained annually by Kinder Morgan. Uh, on private land, Kinder Morgan works with the landowners to ensure vegetation is kept to a safe and level distance. Um, aerial patrols monitor the entire right of way, a minimum of every two weeks. Um, all, all of those reports that come in from that are fully investigated. Um, all construction near the right of way is monitored. And then we also perform weekly driving patrols on the pipeline. So this is a picture of the actual plane that flies this line. Um, flies out of Vancouver's Evergreen Airport. Um, if you if you look up, you hear you hear a plane, and you look up. It you know we fly almost weekly, and it says pipeline patrol on the bottom of the wings, and it flies at about 300 feet. So you, it's very visible. Um, we also uh, have anti-corrosive protective coating and a cathodic protective system installed on the pipe. Uh, we run electronic tools called smart pigs through the pipe at regular intervals, and this is required by DOT. Uh, what they do is, this is a picture of one right here, um, is it's about 10 feet long. Uh, they detect anomalies in the pipeline, allowing us to complete repairs or perform preventative maintenance. Uh, they also provide GPS positioning of the pipe in, relativity, in relative to the earth. So these smart pigs, um, they're run every five years as per DOT and FEMSA. FEMSA. Um, and what they do, what they look for is the pipe wall thickness irregularities, and that's like, that's metal loss or corrosion. Um, they look for long seam features or narrow axial flaws, that, that's like gouges or notches or fissures. Um, the geometry of the line, they look at the geometry of the line, and that's to locate third party damage, you know, by an excavation or an excavator. Um, and also construction anomalies or deformation or dents. Uh, when, when these reports come in, any of these anomalies are analyzed and investigated by a team of integrity experts. And depending on the class of the anomaly, uh, it'll be exposed and physically examined and repaired. And what I mean by that is, well, you know, we may shut the pipeline down and send a crew out to dig it up based on that GPS uh, and physically inspect it and make a repair or if necessary. Um, smart pigs are constantly evolving, um, and KM keeps up to date with the, all the new tools, and we also trial experimental tools to help improve the technology. Uh, with that, I'll pass it on to uh, John Gray, and he can talk a little bit more about pipeline protection and uh, the one call system. Thank you. Okay, a little bit more about pipeline protection. Uh, the leading cause of pipeline accidents is third-party damage caused by digging and excavation. Call before you dig is the law, and Kinder Morgan operates within the state one-call laws. Uh, we respond to one calls within 48 hours, if not sooner. Uh, we mark our lines and work is planned within 50 feet, and work is, when work is planned within 10 feet of our lines, we require an inspector to be on site at all times while work is going on. If you happen to notice work is being done in an area and you suspect a one call has not been made, please let us know. So call before you dig, how utility locates work. I'm going to summarize this slide. Uh, there's a lot of information up there. But in a nutshell, if excavation is going to be conducted, 
The contractor will identify the area of excavation, mark it out in white. They'll make a call to the one call center and open a one call ticket. And when that ticket is generated, they'll identify the location of the excavation and the system will identify any utilities within that area. And an automatic message will be sent out to any companies that have utilities in that area. Those companies then have 70, 48 hours to respond and identify and mark out their lines before any construction or excavation can begin. So these are some examples of some locates. Here's a, where our line has been located underneath the pavement and identified. And right up here is a line marker that identifies the, the location of the line also. And in open field areas, the locations will be marked out with flags. So if the one call markings are between zero and 50 feet, we'll mark our lines. If the line is within 10 to 25 feet of the excavation, we'll periodically monitor the construction site. We'll make sure they're not getting any closer than what they said they were gonna be and they're staying outside of the 25 feet. If it's between zero or 10 feet, we will have an active standby on site anytime there's any construction going on within that 10 feet. So here's some more examples of line identification. You can see there's a line marker sign on the side of the street. It's marked on the pavement. This is a, a block valve used for isolation, isolating various sections of the pipeline. And these are aerial markers. In open areas, those are placed every, every mile along the line. In open areas, it helps the pilot identify in specific sections of pipe if there is something to report. Here's a typical line marker. All the line markers have 24-hour contact information. This is our Houston Control Center. And this is the local contact information number for the uh, Portland station. So this is an example of an offset marker. Certain situations where the line is under the pavement or a sidewalk, and you can't put a marker directly on top of it, there'll be an offset marker, and it'll identify that it is an offset marker. And we try and keep it identified on the asphalt whenever possible. Uh, high traffic areas, we're continuously out there keeping the paint refreshed and visible. So Kinder Morgan Public Awareness Program. Kinder Morgan contacts landowners on the right of way every other year. Particular attention is paid to schools, fire, police stations. All pipeline inquiries are followed up by local personnel to ensure people get the information that they request. Uh, con contact directly with uh, contractors is vital. Uh, we will always meet with contractors anytime there's any excavation going on. So on our Kinder Morgan website, there's a e-newsletter quarterly bulletin that comes out. And this is available to the public. There's public aware information, safety information, and this is available to the public or anybody that wants to, excuse me. And it's located on our Kinder Morgan website. The local contact numbers. If at any time you think there's an emergency, First call is always 911. Uh, if you have a pipeline related, uh, Port Portland Station contact number 24 seven is right here. That's the number that's on the line markers. And the Houston Control Center number is also on the line markers. And there's an additional uh, 24 hour emergency notification line also. Are there any questions? All right, we were going to hand out, I'm sorry. Should know already. Anybody with the pipeline on their property will receive notifications. That should be in the uh, disclosure when you purchase the house. So I believe they were going to pass out the note cards for questions. Uh, 
the location, the depth varies. Uh, most locations, it's four feet deep at least. Some some areas deeper. mentioning if we have normal operating condition typically through this through the computer system that we refer to as SCADA a pretty general term within the industry um, any of that information that we collect that um, you know pressure pressure uh, and temperature sensors flow rates uh, all sorts of things if we get something that is out of a normal operating condition for the pipeline we have an upper and lower control limit identified in that computer system the operator on duty gets an immediate alarm, both a visible and an audible alarm, and they take action based on that. If we, if we cannot explain immediately what's going on, we go through a shutdown of the pipeline until we find out why we have an anomaly in the operating condition. Yeah, we have to shut the pump down. You're right. We shut the pump down first because you want to you want to take the pressure off the line before you start closing all the valves. And so we have the pump station in Portland is the start of the line. And so um, we have two two large pumps there that that push product basically over Forest Park, the hill at Forest Park, and then it makes its way down south. We have a booster station about at the midpoint of the pipeline, uh, just south of Salem with another two pumps that then push it the rest of the way about 54 miles into our Eugene terminal. But we want to make sure that we're shutting down those pumps prior to starting to close the valves in a, in a certain sequence. Yeah. The line is eight inch. Yeah, all, all the way from Portland to Eugene, it's an eight inch line. It, it varies. Um, under the river, it's, it's a half inch. And in other locations, it's about a quarter inch. Yeah. Yeah, but where you go under rivers or more sensitive locations, it typically we use um, double wall or double thickness pipe. Oh, how far, where does the thickness change? Um, it's going to be up beyond the bank on either side. In the kissing case of the Willamette River here, I didn't bring an alignment sheet, what we call an alignment sheet with all the engineering details with us tonight, but it typically is on either side of the bank before that. Thickness changes and we go to the thicker wall pipe under the river. Starting pressure um, coming out of the main pumps at Portland Station is close to about 1400 PSI. Now, by the time you get, you know, that, and that's required to get it up over that hill. So we're going from almost zero uh, to 1100 feet in elevation within a mile to get it up. Um, but by the time you're coming down to this, this length of the end of the line, we're probably. 400 pounds, thank you, yeah, yeah, and that's why, yeah, yeah, and that's why we have to have a booster station in Salem, you know, because you're starting to, through friction loss in the pipe, you're starting to lose pressure on flow, and then we boost it the rest of the way, and we did, you did make a, a mention of what we call drag reducing agent, and that's, that's something that's come about probably in the last 20 years, and that's helped to really uh, reduce the amount of pressure in some cases you put on the line or how many pumps you run. It's a, it's a chemical. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's it, what's in all of it. It's uh, but it it it, it makes the uh, the product a lot more slippery and it coats the inside of the wall of the pipeline and it makes it flow a lot easier. So you don't have as much friction loss. So we run the pumps. Uh, typically, we can run pumps at lower speed on certain lines. We can run a little bit lower pressure and get the same flow rate.
Uh, it was installed in 1962, so with the system in Portland was built. So there's what we call an inbound system in Portland. So that connects the seven petroleum terminals in Portland to Portland Pump Station. They, they gather there, and then we pump there. And then the line uh, terminates in Eugene, and the terminal in Eugene was built in 1962. So it's, it's, it's younger than me. <laughs> Very likely, yes, yeah. Well, we have uh, we do an integrity review of all of our pipelines on an annual basis, and that we put in a lot of different information into that integrity model, and that's reviewed. We have a whole integrity group in our Houston office, and we use contractors, so that's all they do. Um, so we review that information, we look at changes in seismic criteria, we look at changes in population densities in certain areas, uh, and that gets modeled. Now, I, I, you know, I'm not going to tell you that we, everybody knows exactly what's going to happen you know, in a major earthquake, um, but um, pipelines typically do very well in earthquakes because steel is very flexible over long distances. That's, that's an, uh, a hard question to answer. It really depends on how the pipeline is maintained, and that depends a lot on how you're controlling the corrosion rate and how you inspect it. Um, with new corrosion technologies and cathodic protection and, and um, additives that go into the pipeline and the smart pig technology that we use to run through the line, there really is no defined end life to the pipeline. It's really dependent on you know, the thickness of, of the, uh, the pipe, and any anomalies that are detected. And so the beauty of the, the smart pigs are, you know, we can detect anomalies, you know, much smaller than we've ever been able to, you know. Um, and with the GPS location equipment, that we know exactly where they are. So we get an anomaly, it shows up in the data, we go out and we may, we'll excavate that section and, and we'll confirm, you know, what that data from the smart pig tells us. And at that point, we, you know, we visually decide, and, you know, looking at the, uh, the pipe, what sort of repair needs to be made. But there's really no defined end life to, to a pipeline if it's well maintained. That's not my area of expertise. I'm an operations person, you know, as far as, um, you know, construction techniques and what have you, that would be an integrity and an engineering design question. We can certainly take your question and, and, and uh, get back to you on that. Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. Um, the pipeline, you know, typically when it goes under a river, it's either bored under or it's uh, put in with a, with a cut and fill method, and it's typically pretty deep, especially under a navigable river. Yeah, in, in a case of uh, our pipeline going under the Willamette, it, it's going to be 8 to 12 feet, if not a little bit more in some areas, below the bed of the river. Um, so it's pretty deep. So when you get a lot of... Yeah. Well, and that's, that's a big concern when you do have a lot of high water conditions and, you know, unusual flow of 96 being a great example. That was my first year living up here in the Northwest, so my wife almost went back home. But um, we, uh, we do take that very seriously, and we have our uh, what we call line riders and rider protection personnel that are constantly out riding the line and monitoring the line. They go out, you know, during and after those events, and they really do focus on river crossing, creeks so that could become swollen and you get unusual erosion there. We're looking for any areas where the pipe may be exposed, where it shouldn't be exposed. So that's something that we do. And we keep a, we keep a, a database where we track all of that information. And if we have something that's exposed where it hasn't been before, then we have um, an integrity and repair program to take care of that, yeah. And, and there may be some cases where we do shut the pipeline down because it's crossing a river that is just at some uh, unknown flood stage it's never seen before, yeah. 
So Andrew, we have some good rule followers here, so I have some card <laughs> questions on cards. And everybody else, thank you for your questions. That was great. But I'll ask these questions on the cards so that they don't get overlooked. How often are repairs needed to the pipeline and what tends to be the primary issue? And I think you've touched on that a little. Well, the two things that probably um, get the most attention are um, corrosion. Um, and if we have uh, a corrosion issue, that typically is, is um, uh, an, an exposed area of the pipeline that wasn't exposed before due to something or from, a, from somebody striking the line, not following the state one call you know, uh, requirements and doing excavation and hitting the line. So that, uh, that's our biggest concern. Yeah. This is a detailed question. In addition to the installation of the remote activation uh, valve installed upstream of the water intakes. What has been done to reinforce the integrity of the pipeline in the event of a cascade fault event? And then note is I asked this question as the pipeline was constructed before seismic potential uh, was known, and I think that was touched on a little bit as well. This is a you know it's a question that I I get a lot about what happens in the Cascadia subduction zone event. I wish I had a great answer for that. I don't think anybody in this room has an answer for what happens to anything in the region. You know, but there's a lot of models out there that say what happens in a 9.0 event. Um, models are great, but sometimes reality doesn't always match what the model tells us. Um, you know, so I, it's, it's one of those unanswerable questions, to be quite honest with you. All I can tell you is based on earthquakes that have happened around the world, pipelines typically do fare very well because of their flexibility. But, you know, I, I'm not in a position with um the data that we have and what we know to, to speculate on a 9.0 earthquake at this point and how that would that would impact you know I, I think personally i think if uh if i crawl out from under the rubble and i'm still alive after that i'll be pretty happy i appreciate the work that kinder morgan and the city of wilsonville have done with respect to the potential for an event evolving the river what other assessments and upgrades have been done on the pipeline pipeline throughout the entire line PDX to Eugene given its age well some of the biggest upgrades really have to do with um, cathodic protection or corrosion protection again that's kind of one of the biggest issues that affects the longevity and the safety of a pipeline and and the science behind cathodic protection has changed so much in the last 10 to 20 years that that's been a huge a huge development so putting in um, sacrificial anodes, cathodic protection systems, knowing the science of what's impacting the pipeline, um, stray currents, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of new uh, technology out there that detects stray current that could impact the pipeline in certain areas. So that's really the big, one of the biggest areas. Also, um, the smart pig technology is really uh, critical to safe operation of the pipeline and identifying any anomalies in the pipe so we can correct those conditions before they become a, an incident. How does the shutdown valve, shutdown valve work in the event of a major power failure? And this is a two-part question. And the second part is, what criteria tr triggers the need to shut down the system? And what is the estimated um, valve? What? Pardon? No. Oh, OK, so what? You know, how much would leak before you would know it and know to shut down? Thank you. So it's uh, there's a lot of parts to that question. Um, um, a power failure. Well, these are all they're they're all controlled by um, by power from uh, from the power grid. So uh, you know if if we do have a power failure, then everything pretty much goes offline at that point, um, and that goes for our pumping system too. So if we lose power in the air, we lose pumping pressure too. So the line kind of shuts down at that point. Um, how do we detect a leak against detected, you know, by an anomaly uh, in the SCADA data, typically? Um, and that system is really very sensitive. And, and Lane, you probably, I think, have a good example of we had an issue about two years ago where a terminal that was delivering product into us from Portland, um, the operator of the terminal made a change in which tank they were, they were delivering product to. And we saw a pressure variation of uh, four pounds over, I think, eight seconds. That was detected by the system. We didn't know why that anomaly had occurred, so we shut the entire pipeline down based on that.
Well, again, that depends, you know, if there were a breach of the pipeline for whatever reason, an excavator hits it or, or whatever the case may be, it depends where it is. Um, so it depends where in the line you are. Obviously, the pressure varies, you know, from the closer to the pumps you are, the higher the pressure is. Depends on what elevation the, the break may occur. Um, obviously, if you're down at the bottom of a hill, you know, you have more stuff coming down from the top of the hill and how close you are to one of the valves. You know, it can vary. We're required by federal law under DOT FIMSA to provide what they call a worst case number on the pipeline. Now, when you do worst case calculations for an agency, it's not always based on a reality. But, and I'll tell you the criteria that the DOT requires for a pipeline release. It is uh, a break occurs, a complete break occurs of the pipeline. Pipeline is completely severed for through whatever reason. We don't shut down that pipeline for 15 minutes. So we just keep the pumps running for 15 minutes, no matter what the data tells us. Um, and it's just, just you know, being released out of the pipeline, and then we shut the line down. So you have that amount of volume that comes out of the pipe, and then you have whatever is left that will drain down due to gravity. So it depends on the location. You know, different locations, they could be a couple hundred barrels to, um, you know, in this particular area, our worst case number would be about a little over a thousand barrels. Can you, um, this is a question having to do with the drill you just did. Can you discuss key learning and action items that, w that have resulted from this most recent drill? Well, we do, we do drills on a regular basis. You know, we do, um, we do a, what we call a worst case drill. It's required by different agencies uh, on a three year cycle. We also do a smaller drill on an annual basis. Um, and then we do uh, actual equipment deployments on an annual basis at our facilities. Um, for this particular event, um, it was it was very similar to some of the drills we've done in the past, but with with a couple of major differences. Uh, one of the uh, the differences being the involvement of the city and the uh, the Willamette Water Supply folks, and we were really looking for their involvement because of the concern over the water intake, which is about 2,100 feet downriver from where our pipeline crosses. And so, you know, the learning event was. You know, how do, we, how do we quickly communicate with them if we were to, to see an anomaly and have a suspected release, how quickly they can shut down the intake, uh, what would happen if anything were to get into the intake, how we would uh, manage that. So that was really one of our big learning events uh, with this drill. Typically in every drill, in this particular drill, we had representatives from, as I mentioned earlier, I think, uh, US EPA, US Coast Guard, we had Oregon DEQ, we had the Oregon Department Department of Health, we had um, Walton Valley Fire and Rescue, we had the city of Wilsonville and uh, the Willamette Water Supply folks, and uh, he might not have captured everybody, but it goes, yeah, but they're very well attended by agencies, and we had about 120 people at the drill, uh, all sorts of different disciplines, so they are designed to, number one, test our ability to respond to an event um, as a unified group. And when you, when you start these drills, we follow a system that's followed throughout the, uh, the United States called the Incident Command System. So uh, for any of our you know, law enforcement folks, they understand that. It's followed by the Fire Department, Homeland Security. And so in that uh, early stages, we form what's called the Unified Command. And so that uh, is Kinder Morgan or whoever the potentially responsible party is. There'll be a federal representative, typically EPA or Coast Guard, state representative, so DEQ here in Oregon and a local representative, and you had your local rep from the city of Wilsonville, and we form a unified command. And the key term there is unified. And so everybody in that group is part of the decision-making process, and they all have their groups that work within different teams in the structure that helps to bring information in and help to make that the decision as to what the objectives are uh, to, um, you know, cleaning up that, uh, that event. So. Uh, I think it was very successful. I mean, I, I think it was one of the one of the best drills we've had in this area, and I think that the city folks, I think, felt that it was very very helpful for them too. So, so that's all the questions left. But I, I think we can go back to the audience now and and hear from people who still have. Talk about it. Well, you're concerned with, with all of that, um, you know, primarily, you know, the two products that we carry, primarily gasoline and diesel on the pipeline. So gasoline is a flammable product, diesel is combustible. Um, so 
you know, the first concern with any sort of potential release or real releases is, is the safety of people. You know, whether it's people that live near the pipeline, emergency responders that are going to be probably the first on scene, our own personnel, and then people that come to clean it up. So um, we want to make sure that we, we isolate that area. We use a lot of tools. We use what's called the, and I see, you know, to Walton Valley Fire and Rescue there. So we use initially what's called the emergency response guidebook. It's something that's uh, utilized by, by responders. And that tells you, you're not sure what the product is. You open the book, you find, okay, the product, diesel fuel. Here's how far away we need to keep everybody initially, how many feet, so many hundreds of feet, um, until we can do monitoring and determine that it's safe to get closer to the area. So it's very controlled at that point. But, um, you know, so it's a combination of those things, you know, and, and we really, you know, the last thing you want to do is to have anything ignite and have a, have a fire. And so if there's any, any sort of a release, we really want to shut everything down in the area and, and move people away until it's safe to get closer. Well, it, 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 it does two things. Um, it, number one, it makes it a little bit easier to get to because you know, you've got an open area where it runs through the right of way. But, but um, anywhere you have high voltage, then it does complicate things a little bit. So just getting close to the area, if you needed to bring heavy equipment in to deal with it, you've got power line concerns. So you've got safety concerns there. Uh, and really, you know, where you're operating a pipeline close to um, a power line, uh, that's where a lot of your cathodic protection systems really have to be top notch because you don't want any straight current that comes off of those high voltage lines that then can then find its way into the steel of your pipeline and create accelerated corrosion. And so it, it does complicate things, but that's where our experts in cathodic protection come in is to protect the line at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's 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 pretty deep in those areas, um, as as we mentioned. You know, and we do go through a lot of steep terrain. You know, probably the most challenging is the very beginning of our pipeline, where we go from almost zero to eleven hundred feet up the west side of Forest Park. There, yeah, yeah, have yeah yeah. So, but um, but but then again, that's that's you know something that we uh, if it, there were to be an event, we would be out there you know looking for, especially in sensitive areas where there are a lot of steep slopes, where there are rivers, um, you know, river currents that can change. You know, we're looking for any exposures um, that could create a problem. And there's been a question over here for a while. And I'm sorry I didn't get to you. That's a, that's a great technical question, and I'll hand that over to our expert, yeah. uh, Lanny. Well, gasoline, diesel, these are all different. Yeah, and in some pipelines, we do have, we do run all three products, but this one is only gas and diesel. Our jet and our jet pipeline in Portland is dedicated. It's only Jet A. Um, but it, basically, uh, you just have a, you have a section, you have an interface that you cut out in Eugene, which is Transmix, which then gets returned back to the refinery. Or, or somebody that can use it, it gets so, sold. So there is some blending of the two. Yes. 
Yes. So you're not like using gas. Well, we're missing, well, by gas, I mean gasoline. So we're only, yeah, we're only dealing with liquids, but we do get an interface. And so in the event of emergency, you could encounter uh, one or the other or both. Um, the both is very unlikely, but um, we do have an interface. You know, typically it's a, you know, a couple hundred barrels. Yeah, you cut it out into a tank, into a specified tank in Eugene, and then it gets either, it gets trucked back to um, a refinery or some end user that can use that type of product. We are. Um, our, our SCADA system doesn't touch the outside world. Um, you know, our business net network that we, you know, email, all that stuff, none of that stuff, it, none of those two networks never touch. Um, so it's completely isolated from the outside world. All right. Any more nice technical questions like that? Those are, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, just, I'm just Yeah. We, yeah. Well, and that's that's a great question because I think you know if if it wasn't something that was specific to just our pipeline, if it was something that was more regional or in nature, we we would like to certainly like to be invited into and we would probably we would probably in the incident command structure at that point we would probably tuck in as a technical specialist or part of the operations group then we certainly wouldn't be part of your unified command structure at that point if it wasn't directly related to the pipeline but if it had a potential to to affect us then we would we would like to be invited into that so yeah yeah Well, if we have a seismic event, um, hopefully we can get to all these places, you know, um, hopefully all of us can get to the various places um, in a 9.0 earthquake. We have, um, we have enough people here in Oregon uh, for a 114 mile pipeline. We have about 40 employees here. So um, that are, you know, live really along the right of way. You know, we're all, we're all within, you know, a half an hour of pipeline. Um, so we could certainly, Assuming that roads and bridges and all those other things are still operable and passable, we could certainly, yeah, that's, and, the, and, and again, that's why, that's why I hesitate to speculate on, on what happens after a 9 point earthquake, because none of us know, really, but, um, but, you know, we, if we could get there, we'd certainly participate um, as much as we could, yeah. Well, and we've heard that, yeah, we heard a lot about that uh, during the drill yesterday, so, yeah, thanks for reminding me. One more question in the back.
Well, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of elements to your comment. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll, I'll let Alan uh, address that. So, are you familiar with um, Oregon Solutions? Um, yeah. So we met Andrew and I with Carmen Four. I remember her last name because she shares my last name. Um, but she used to work for uh, the governor, and she is now part of. And I, I'm not sure what affiliation that is. Who? Portland State. Thank you very much, Portland State. So uh, we were interviewed as part of a report that they issued on uh, seismic events and infrastructure. And that was recently issued, uh, I don't know, maybe a few months ago. Um, and we've got a copy of that if you haven't seen it. And uh, so I think that was an effort to start a dialogue about the connectivity between the various um, pieces. Um, and we're doing that in other states. In California, we're part of a discussion there. Um, so as far as representative working with you or uh, I'm not sure what state agency specifically would have, yeah. We certainly have worked with them. And we did have, we did have a representative from uh, Oregon uh, Emergency Management, um, Deanna Henry, came and we've actually had a dialogue with Deanna for several years. They're, they're a key piece of this guy. Um, you know, directly, you know, day-to-day -day operations um, really go through and drill, drill elements really go through the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality and Skills Group. This head in Portland um, managed that, and that currently that's managed by a um, gentleman by the name of Mike Golich. We don't, and the reason why is because if we had if we had generators, we could run the pumps at our facility. There are seven facilities that have to feed that location, and they don't have enough capacity to provide that power to run all their equipment. And and really, under under current operating conditions, um, and within the guidance of DOT, FIMSA, um, we really don't want to run a pipeline without everything operating, all the telemetry. Uh, all the pressure sensors, everything else. So, you know, if you've got power down, we really, we really don't want to be running a line um, without everything, all the safety uh, features in place. So, just to add to that, we do have we do have backup power in order to, you know, the pumps may go down, but we can still see what's going on on the pipeline um, for quite a while. We have backup power to to monitor the pipeline after the pumps go down because of a power loss. Right. If if you have a major seismic event and you lose power, we're, we're going to be down with everybody else, and we won't be pumping. Uh, no, but it, it, we can see the all the pressures and and all the the flows and and you can see the status of everything elsewhere that does have power. You'll see the status. What it what it allows you do to do is when the pumps go down, then you can monitor the pipeline going down. It doesn't you know it doesn't shut down instantly. It comes. Stop, stop the car. So you monitor it down, and then once it's down, you cut everything off and you wait for the power to come. The stuff at the station you're doing through hardware at Portland Station, everything down the line you're doing through telemetry. So, that, so we have two modes of communication that can back each other up. So cellular or satellite. Yeah, the communications are, as Lane said, we can, we can see those, you know, the, those transmitters remotely. Uh, we just don't have enough, you know, you lose power to be able to operate big, big pieces of equipment, pumps and valves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the tanks, yeah.
Yeah. Well, it's kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complete system, you know, and, and you, you can't have a pipeline without a tank or a pump, so, you know, you have to have the whole system needs to be operable. Well, some of it comes in by, by ship, and some of it comes down Olympic pipeline, so, um, you know, in, in a big earthquake, they, they'll be shut down, too, very likely, because we know. Yeah, well, that... Yeah, yeah, and and we've done a, we've done a lot of drills within, not just within our industry, but but the, the electrical power distribution industry, and you know Portland Emergency Management, the state's emergency management, FEMA, U.S. Department of Energy. We've we've had a lot of drills in the Northwest in the last ten years, and you know it's again there's a lot of modeling, and, and but nobody knows ultimately how it's going to turn out when if that event does happen in our lifetimes. But um, it's going to take a while to to get things back up. You know, because you have to have all the components that work. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, for, for coming. Hopefully, you learned a little bit more about, about our pipeline and about our company. And, yeah. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yeah.